Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Dear Ms. T with our very favorite psychotherapist, Terry Ruel. Good morning, Terry. Good morning, and good morning, everyone. It's nice to be back with you. I cannot believe that we are almost in the fall. Um, I guess like everything is feeling so accelerated now. The This summer really flew by. I, I'm not sure if it did for everyone, but it, it sure did for me. <laughs> I can't believe we're into September. But um, that's okay because um, we are in an accelerated time of growth as well as challenge. And we are doing it. We're getting there one step at a time. Um, it doesn't always feel that way. But I was thinking about that um, this last couple of weeks about the um, one of my favorite authors and she had written Anne Lamont uh, about putting the octopus to bed every night and not, with so many arms of what to be freaked out about next and just when you think you have all the arms under the covers another one pops out <laughs> and I thought that was one of the best descriptions I've heard of the times <laughs> we are living in <laughs> It's like putting an octopus to bed. (laughs) And yes, there are so many arms popping out all the time. And it is hard to not be freaked out. Um, You know, these are, as you say, not only accelerated times, but they are uncertain times. And the other thing that kept crossing my mind was that this whole pandemic process kind of reminds me of the therapeutic process and um, of course that's kind of where my mind always goes but I thought maybe it would be helpful to look at it that way since we're in the second year of the pandemic and um, the first year of the pandemic is all was all was much like the first year of therapy Um, When people first come into therapy, you know, we're usually coming in because some crisis has precipitated finally going there. And that first year is often spent on um, just coping with the crisis, learning how to, um, you know, do what we have to do in our life to be able to solve whatever the problem was. And and be able to cope with the change. And that's kind of how I see the pandemic that first year was we all um, had to learn how to cope with being home, doing school at home, you know, just all the things that came with social distancing. And so it was kind of clear, you know, a little easier in some ways because we kind of figured out what the problem was and what we needed to do and then it was just trying to learn how to cope with that change with that change but now getting into the second year and before we know it the third year it's getting into the deeper issues and if people stay in therapy and want to really look at maybe what um, was at the root of that crisis um they will start to get into the deeper issues. And this is when things get pretty tough, (laughs) which, you know, we don't want to hear because it already seems like the first year was tough enough. Um, But the, the good side of that is that the, out of this hard work, this deeper work comes the greater rewards, the greater, um, change so you know we can look at it like you know we we're doing this through pain or we're doing this through joy so even though um the second year of depth um seeking may be painful there can be a joy in the knowledge that maybe we're really going to get at the root of these problems and start making real solutions. So, 
you know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, maybe we're going to stop the insanity. And that insanity includes all those octopuses' arms, right? The, the, all the things that we get outraged about, the, you know, um, lack of, of sacredness towards Mother Earth, the ongoing forever wars, the racism and the injustices, you know, so many of those octopuses' arms. But like I say, the great challenge is that we have so many um, arms to look at. But it's only going to be in facing that, of course, that we're going to be able to ever solve that. And one of the things that happens in therapy when we begin to go into the deeper work is we have to demythologize our parents. You know, especially when we start doing our childhood or inner child work, there comes a painful time where our child in us, our adolescent in us, and then our adult recognizes that our parents had their shadow sides too. And sometimes we know that on an intellectual level much earlier, but we start to go through the grief of having to not only admit but accept that our parents were not gods and they made mistakes and they wounded us. And that is a great grief that we go through. And I kind of see us um, that loss of innocence happening now at a societal level for many people if we're not in denial. Um, we're demythologizing know our heroes and these systems that we wanted to believe were infallible or you know that we idolized uh, even the supreme court you know many 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 are greatly disappointed in the supreme court and that may have been their last bastion of um idealizing the, this country so you know we're in that in that deep water of having to face the human side of all of us, that all systems, all people are capable of, um, you know, great hurt to themselves and to other people. And, and ignorance as far as not being able to see or hear the pain of others. So that is, you know, that's a loss of innocence as a society, too, that I think we're going through. And it forces accelerated growth, you know, growth on steroids. We can either choose to use all these, all this painful recognition as, you know, ways to grow, or we can um, have ourselves you know, our defenses come back up and sometimes, you know, most people who are in their defenses are not even conscious of it. So it's not about blaming. It's about being able to recognize that if people aren't ready to be able to face the, this kind of pain, they will go into denial or they will blame or they will try to rationalize or minimize and that is what we've seen that and it's causing you know great havoc and and hurt to not only ourselves and each other but to mother earth and so you know how do we how do we live with this right now how do we do this how do we come back from this pandemic in a way that is different because if you're vaccinated, you do feel some sense of freedom and you can do some more things, but everybody's not fully vaccinated and kids aren't, little kids aren't vaccinated yet. So now we're faced with a little more freedoms, but many more decisions and decisions are hard to make right now too, because we're already feeling some weariness 
of just trying to cope with all these changes. But we are, it is being forced upon us, you know. So there is another, um, you know, uh, challenge of growth is how do I learn to make these decisions that I must make, you know, as far as do I send my kids back to school or do I do virtual? All the different kinds of decisions. Do I, you know, attend this concert? It's outdoors. Um, do I wear a mask? Or do I not? Um, do I want to go to the grocery store? Do I want to keep ordering my groceries? Um, how much do I want to fly, if at all? I mean, it, there could be a million different decisions. And we're going to have to continue to make these because this is an ongoing process, right? The pandemic, the changes, the challenges are ongoing. And... You know, sometimes for us older people, um, be 70 in the spring, I have more life experiences that can make it a little bit easier to go with that flow of, of these kind of changes happening a lot. But it also, for a lot of us, is do we, you know, am I going to have the energy to do this? And then for children, it can be easier for them to go with the flow of these changes because they don't have the biases of the past, you know, like I want it to be like it used to be, you know, they're kind of more just live in the moment, live in the now, which is the great gift they teach us. And so they don't grieve the past having to go through these changes like we do. And they don't have as difficult time you know, going with them because they don't have all these memories attached and, you know, emotions attached to the way things used to be and, and having difficulty letting go of that. So it's often, you know, really hard on the people who are, what, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. I mean, every age has its challenges, but most of uh, the people in middle age, you might call it, or young to middle age, have more um, challenges because they have more decisions to make, more things to face. And this is often when people come into therapy is middle age, but it is getting younger and younger now because a lot of the stigma is off, and thank God, and um, people are free, feeling more like it's a it's a way to take care of themselves and a healthy thing, which it is, to reach out and ask for help. And it can be a therapist or it can be a friend or you can build it in your own pods and communities. So, you know, we really are going to need to um, support each other through this. And, and to try to not be afraid of these challenges, to know that you are already doing it. You know, that's one of the things age brings because you can look back and you can see, oh, well, I thought I'd never get through that, but I did, <laughs> you know, and I was doing it all along, even though I wasn't necessarily aware of it. And that is what you're all doing. You are putting one foot in front of the other and you are doing it. So even when we feel like we're not going to be able to, we do. You you are doing it. The challenge of the second and third year and this octopus are, it, it's going to be two steps forward and one step back, maybe for a long time. And that is something that we don't like to accept you know it we really want to have progress and feel like we're keep going keeping on going forward and you can get that from doing your inner work but you're not going to see it so much in the outside so this is a time of inner and outer work so we have to keep doing the inner work to f to know that you are growing and and making progress even though it may be painful at times. Um, and even though on the outside, it doesn't seem like things are changing for the good because all the 
teachers and elders are telling us that what has to change is what people value. And that is going to be a huge, difficult thing to change. And it's going to take a lot of time. And because people value, often value similar things, but how they see that being valued can be very, very different. And sometimes people value very, very different things. So, you know, we may um, see things get a lot worse before they get better on the outside. But that doesn't mean that we can't keep growing on the inside and that that growth is going to help you deal with what's happening on the outside. You know, the environmental challenges that we face with climate change and the environmental changes that are going to come and the suffering that we are going to either be uh, part of at times because of storms or fires or whatever, or we're going to, um, you know, suffer because we see the suffering of, of others is going to be there. Whether we want to, you know, we believe it's because um, people don't change and don't um, start to create real values without going through enough suffering, um, or it's just out of ignorance, uh, brainwashing, just not believing things have to change because they have been misinformed. Whatever it is, Mother Nature is going to force change. She already is, and we know that, and we see that. And she, you know, the nature is a law. It's not uh, uh, something that we can, um, you know, change by trying to make it an uh, emotional thing. You know, the law of nature is the law of nature. Mother Nature will do everything to give us life, but she cannot go beyond, you know, it's like our bodies. We can, our bodies give us everything possible to keep our life going and to give us life, but if we keep putting in stuff that's bad for us, eventually the system is going to break down. And it doesn't matter how much we might try to tell ourselves that we love ourselves. We have to do, we have to put in the, you know, the healthy stuff and not put in the unhealthy stuff or the system will break down. So, you know, we're, all of this is connected and it's not that there isn't hope, because, but hope the elders tell us comes from principled leadership and people modeling values that are, you know, integrity and love and truth and honesty and turning the other cheek, you know, loving our enemy. It doesn't mean that we don't get outraged at times and that we work against injustice. It's just the opposite. You know, principled um, leadership is activism. You know, it is principled activism. It is nonviolent action. Okay, so we all have a responsibility to keep hope alive to ourselves and each other and the younger uh, um, by doing a kind of principal leadership in whatever way we can. And that can be role modeling for our children that you still treat others kindly no matter what and that you love Mother Earth and all the things that we know are, are true for um, that come from a place of love and joy. And we still try to, to make sure we bring joy into our lives, especially for the children, even in the midst of, like you say, what's, what can be chaos all around. We are learning from this challenge, though, that 
the gift of uncertainty is learning how to live in the now and how to have gratitude for every little thing. And those are huge gifts because the more we live in the now and the more we are aware and have gratitude for every living thing, every little thing, the more that changes the outside. It not only changes us inside and our children in the role modeling we're doing to help others, but it's going to change things on the outside. It has a ripple effect. Everything has a ripple effect. There's nothing small in the eyes of God or in the acts of love. They all have ripple effects. So we have to hang on to that hope so that we know we can keep passing that on too. So, you know, it is generally kind of weird to be back to um, so-called some normalcy. But at the same time, we're not back to it, it, it. We know in some level it's not normal. And there have been a lot of changes. And for some people, you know, very deep changes. They've lost people to COVID. Um, there's very deep great grief um, attached to their, their past and trying to move forward. So it's disorientating at times, and we have to make time for ourselves to do the grief work as well as let that disorientation come to the, you know, to the light so that we can release it and we can recenter and uh, feel grounded again. And like I say, it's, it's going to be a challenge because this is an everyday thing now. It's not going to be very easy to, you know, do some work and then feel like we're just in a really, you know, I'm in a really great place for weeks and weeks um, because of what's going on in the outside. These octopus arms are going to keep popping out from under the covers. If it's not this, it's that. If it's not that, it's this, you know. So it's going to be trying to knock us off center every day. And, of course, we've talked about, you know, being very um, aware of how much time we're spending on, on things that are um, feeding us, you know, too much fearful news over and over or um, too much negativity over and over. But at the same time, you know, uh, mystics, are, uh, prophets are mystics in action. So, you know, we want to know enough that we can make decisions about what things we want to be active about in changing in bringing about the values that we hold dear and that we think are going to um, be a help in the world. And, you know, I'm sure with all of us listening, we're all kind of on the same page as far as highly value love and kindness as probably and compassion is probably some of our highest values um, as well as honesty and truth and seeking your own truth as well as bringing the truth out in the world so you know being vaccinated can give us a little more freedom to be a little more active or a little more involved if, if uh, that's how we feel we can be of the most use or we can um, pass on hope to others as well as try to create the values in our society that we need to, to change, you know, the dir directory, however you say that, I can never say that word right, that we're on, um, which is in the wrong direction right now. So, so, Terry, with regard to what you just said about the trajectory, part of it is um, having some compassion for those people who, let's say, were not vaccinated and now find themselves very ill. Definitely. And some people have the thought form of, well, they should have gone and, and received their immunization or their inoculation. It's their fault. They go to the bottom of the line. 
zero mm-hmm. compassion being shown. So there can be anger and frustration as it yes. pertains to the whole, but looking at people as individuals and having compassion for the fact that they find themselves very ill um, or dying Mm -hmm. um, because they did not receive the vaccination. How do we begin to groom some compassion for those people rather than just whitewashing everything with rage? Yes, it's difficult because we have to demythologize ourselves. We have to do enough work on ourselves that we come to the place that we recognize that we, every single one of us, is as capable as every cruelty that's been done in the world as we are capable of every kindness that's been done in the world. And that's a hard thing to accept. You know, I can remember when I was younger, you know, thinking, you know, how could nazis ever do that how could people ever do what they did you know i could never do that well the more you work on yourself the more you you know start to recognize that we all have this you know myth that we want to carry about who we are that you know we aren't capable of cruelty um, or capable of that kind of ignorance or capable of being brainwashed that way. You know, I, I've seen it the most working with addictions. You know, none of us want to believe we could ever be a drug addict or an alcoholic. Um, everyone is capable of that. We all have that, um, you know, that in shadow side of us and those sides of us that are wounded that cause us to do the things that we do and when people aren't conscious of that and haven't gotten help to work on that and to be able to see their shadow sides they can't heal that and it is a shadow side of ourselves when we can't see that not having compassion for someone else is a part of our shadow so, you know, it's, it takes a lot of work and it's painful work because we don't want to have to, you know, look at those parts of ourselves. Um, but we find that as we heal, com- you know, become whole, we can see and experience the difference between being outraged that something injustice happening or unjust is happening but at the same time not um, hate the person for their lack of being able to uh, understand or see what they're doing it doesn't mean that we don't try to stop it you know it's like Martin Luther King and Gandhi and all of them you know that's what nonviolent resistance um, is about is we don't become the thing that we are trying to change but at the same time we we don't we try to find ways to to change it to stop it to end it I love that so something that you've said twice now a phrase that you've used twice now I find very intriguing breaking down our own mythology yes you know if you can think of it as you know, how we demythologize our parents doing our inner child work where we came to see their humanness, their their shadow sides or their wounds or their inability to parent us in the way they needed to. We come to demythologize ourselves to be able to see that we have maybe not those exact same wounds, but that we are all wounded in ways that blind us from seeing our whole selves until we become whole enough and to be able to look at those and say, oh, you know, that was cruel of me. I am capable of being cruel. I said that something very hurtful or I treated that person very hurtful. And then to be able to forgive ourselves and, you know, make amends if, if, if we're able, if the person can handle that without being hurt again, you know, it's like they say in AA, you don't 
you know, you don't push yourself on people if they don't want it or aren't ready for it. But mm -hmm. it's not enough to just, um, you know, know it in ourselves. We have to change our behavior and we have to change the way we're um, not only seeing others and seeing the world, but how we're treating others. And that's, you know, a lifelong journey. We're it all is. on this. Together. Yes. And so might you consider talking about that in your October show, Demythologizing Ourselves? Sure. I sure. think that's a great topic. I know I'd like to hear more about how to demythologize myself. Okay, sure. We can talk about that. I'll, I'll think, put my thinking cap on <laughs> over that. <laughs> thank you, Terry, and thank you for another amazing podcast today. Thank you to everybody who joined us from around the world. Oh, um, thank you, everyone, and Congratulations on your book, Dana. Thank you. Minding. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Have a gorgeous day, my friend. Thank you. You also. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.